Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you joining us today. My name is Anherid Lang. I'm the Executive Director of PHAP, that's short for the International Association of Professionals in Humanitarian Assistance and Protection. And I am pleased to be welcoming, welcoming you to today's webinar entitled The Future of Protection in the Nexus. The Role of the Global Protection Cluster and Humanitarian Protection in the Humanitarian Development Peace Security Nexus, organized by PHAP in partnership with the Global Protection Cluster, GPC. As many of you know, PHAP is an inclusive global society of local and international humanitarian actors and other stakeholders on the front lines of assistance and protection efforts worldwide. As an important part of its mission, PHAP engages its community and its analytical capacity to support consultation efforts to bridge the gap between policy and practice. In that context, we are very pleased to have this opportunity to work together with the Global Protection Cluster to support its consultations to inform the GPC strategic re review. Today's webinar is the first in a series of three webinars to be organized in partnership between PHAP and the GPC for this purpose. I'm joined today by co-facilitator Paul White, who is ProCAP advisor to the GPC and is conducting the consultation efforts for this GPC strategic review. And as Paul and I were just discussing before we went on the air today, we are both impressed by the record levels of interest in today's event, with over now 1,100 people having registered, as I understand, either to participate live in this platform or to use the live streaming options or view the recordings. Furthermore, we've had 425 responses to the pre-event survey, which will provide very helpful input to the strategic review. In addition to overall outlook on protection in the nexus and perceptions of risks and opportunities, which we will have a quick look at uh, when we look at the survey results a bit in the event today, survey respondents also shared numerous practical examples in detail from their experiences in different response contexts. And these stories and examples from practice will be featured in the post-event report, which you'll be seeing come out in the next few weeks, and will also make a critical contribution to the GPC's consultation process. So thank you very much to all of you who took the time to submit those responses. I would now like to turn to my co-facilitator, Paul, to say a few words about the purpose of today's webinar and what he hopes to get out of it today. Over to you, Paul. Thanks, Ed Currid. Um, so welcome to everyone. So the Global Protection Cluster is drafting a strategic framework uh, 2020 to 2024 to guide its work over the next five years. Many of you have contributed already. Um, but one issue that needs clarification that many contributors have mentioned is the reforms in the humanitarian system around the nexus. So by nexus, we mean the humanitarian and development and peace, and often we add security as uh, another uh, part of the nexus. So the nexus is the linking or binding together of humanitarian development and peace. It's not a new idea, though. Some see it as just collaboration between humanitarian development, peace and security actors. And it's a continuation of long running efforts in the humanitarian and development fields disaster risk reduction, linking relief, rehabilitation and development, the resilience agenda, I'm sure you know many more. But in its current iteration, some humanitarians think that the nexus is something stronger than just collaboration, and it's pushing us into dangerous territory. Others see it as a fantastic opportunity to ensure humanitarian protection has impact beyond its current limited scope in humanitarian operations. So to inform our strategic framework and work plans, the Global Protection Cluster is keen to establish where we should sit and how we want to bind ourselves together with our development, peace and security colleagues and ensure we join up not just in strategic goals in our diverse fields of practice, but also in implementation of our programs. So today I'd like uh, to understand better at the end of this webinar, how the protection community participating in the webinar see our role working in the broader environment. And of course, how participants think the GPC can help them meet their obligations and expectations. 
So it would be good to hear a bit about the Nexus platforms, Nexus advisors, and the plans for these uh, supports to the UN, to the um, resident coordinators and humanitarian coordinators. We might also ask for some clarity on how the Nexus is coming to life at country level. So they're the things that I'd be interested in hearing from you about. All right, thank you very much, Paul. So getting to today's event and our agenda, we will be covering quite a lot of ground. We'll first start with a brief introduction um, to the concept of protection, how we're using it in the context of this discussion. We will then be asking each of our panelists about their perspectives on protection and on the nexus. We'll then turn to some highlights from the pre-event survey that I mentioned at the beginning that so many of you have filled in, and then we'll discuss some of those results. And then finally, we'll be uh, hopefully having some time at the end to discuss a number of the questions that have been submitted by you as participants, both before and then uh, during the event as well. And um, to the extent that we're not able to get to all of the questions that are coming in during the event, and that may well be the case, we will try to follow those up in writing afterwards. So uh, even if you see we're running low on time, if you have a great question in your mind, please do write that in so we can incorporate it into the after event follow-up. And again, throughout the discussion today, I would encourage you to engage in the chat on the left and also to submit your questions um, so that we can get everyone's views um, into this process and really help uh, Paul and, and all of his colleagues uh, with their consultation okay. efforts. So now I'd like to uh, get started by introducing our guest panelists. So today we're joined by five speakers, all bringing different perspectives on protection and the nexus. So first of all, we have William Chimali, Global Protection Cluster Coordinator. We have Agnese Spiazzi, uh, who is Humanitarian Development Peace Coordination Advisor with the UN Development Coordination Office. And uh, sorry, I wanted to mention we're unmuting all of you um, so uh, we can do a double check of your audio and also give you a, an opportunity to say hello to everyone. So sorry about that. First to you, William. Welcome, William, and thanks so much for, for joining us uh, in the office today. Over to you. Okay. That didn't actually quite work. Shall we give it another try? Yeah, well, uh, thanks. Uh, great to be here and uh, very much looking forward to this discussion. Okay, very good. Thanks so much for being here, William. And uh, now, sorry, Agnese, Agnese Spiazzi joining us um, from, from New York today. How are you? Hello. Good morning. I'm doing fine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all. Great. Thanks for being on the line. And now, Carolyn Kubisarian, who is head of the Unit for Protection of the Civilian Population with the ICRC. Welcome, Carolyn. Great to have you with us. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone, and I'm looking forward to the conversation also. Thank you. And Natasha Rykoff, who is chair of the Conflict Analysis Network. Good afternoon, Natasha. Welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Really looking forward to the conversation. Terrific. Thank you for joining us. And last but not least, Ralph Mamiya, who is executive in residence with the Geneva Center for Security Policy, the GCSP. Welcome, Ralph. Hi. Thank you so much. Terrific. Okay. Um, so we will be getting to our panelists very shortly, but first I would like to ask Paul to help us set the stage by clarifying what we mean by protection in the context of these discussions. As we all know, it can be a bit of a tricky term as it is used by different actors in different ways. Um, so over to you, Paul, to, to get us started with, with some reflections on that. Thank you very much. Um, so to frame our discussion today, I just want to look at the protection in the context of the Nexus from the perspective of the expectations of the GPC. Um, so what expectations do we have towards those actors who take on protection responsibilities and make commitments? Um, 
I think there's a the um, slide there. So the global protection cluster takes uses the definition um, that's very well known to most of you, I expect. Basically, all activities aimed at obtaining full respect for the rights of the individual in accordance with the letter and spirit of the relevant bodies of law, human rights, international humanitarian and refugee law, taking into account age, gender, social, ethnic, national, religious and other backgrounds. Uh, we don't want to get held up in a discussion on how to define or refine protection. That can be a debate for another day. But most of our department, uh, most of our partners use this IASC um, definition as a starting point. In practice, that means that protection is directed at preventing or stopping violations, ensuring a remedy to violations, including the delivery of life-saving goods and services, promoting respect for rights and the rule of law, and creation of early warning systems. So in my consultations uh, on the strategic framework, some colleagues have expressed concern that the nexus might reduce our access to those most in need or the next involvement in the nexus might compromise our commitment to the humanitarian principles, particularly independence, impartiality, and neutrality. So these are not new dilemmas for uh, humanitarians, but as part of a bigger movement or a stronger push towards getting us to work together, some humanitarians feel we have less choice and maybe less influence over how we work. So colleagues involved in protection have moved a long way over the last decade, yet working in the nexus will still create challenges and it will create things that we need to untangle, um, issues that we need to untangle, and we hope that we can do some of that today. The experience of our four areas of operation who emphasize different aspects of protection is also vital to our work. I mean, agencies like UNICEF, who lead the Child Protection AOR, are more familiar with working in a nexus framework, so we can learn much from their experience. But I've identified six expectations that I expect the GPC will have around protection. The language is familiar to many of you, um, whether specifically mandated to do protection work or not. Um, it's not original thought and within the comfort zone of protection officers, yet uh, as we move working beyond our pure humanitarian context and out of our comfort zone, I hope framing it this way as expectations will help identify the gaps or issues we might find when we apply protection in the field in a nexus context. Um, So our first expectation is that our work will, uh, we work together to enhance people's safety, dignity, and rights. Marcus, oh, that's okay. Um, secondly, that we avoid exposing people to harm. So the do no harm principle is vital to our work. And thirdly, that we ensure people's access to assistance is according to need and without discrimination. So we still work in operations in some places where minorities or political opponents of government are discriminated against. Fourthly, um, we want to continue to assist people to recover from the physical and psychological effects of threatened or actual violence, coercion, or deliberative depri deprivation. So again, in many operations, we're not able to cope well, cope well particularly with the psychological aspects of uh, issues that come up. GDB is a classic example where the international system is often not well equipped to work with girls who, for example, escape from ISIS-run brothels that we worked with in various places. 
a fifth expectation is that we'll continue to help people claim their rights. Um, protection's not just about reacting. We want to be able to help people claim their rights. So we welcome opportunities to work in a nexus with those working on developing justice systems. Sixthly, we want to encourage all actors to work and persuade authorities to fulfill their responsibilities. And if they fail to do so, then we expect them to work in dealing with the consequences. So some of our members in my discussions in the consultations have identified issues where working with authorities in one part of a country gives us less access to vulnerable people in another. So how will that impact on the protection work in the nexus? The other key thing is the centrality of protection. This is vital in our work. We want to push this through with our Nexus partners. It's foundational and requires continuous analysis of the risks people face, the threats and vulnerabilities and capacities of affected persons, and of the commitment and capacities of duty bearers to address the risk factors. So protection of all persons affected and at risk must inform humanitarian decision making. And we want to push this into the work of our um, Nexus partners. In practical terms, this means identifying who is at risk, how and why at the very outset of a crisis, and thereafter taking into account the specific vulnerabilities that underlie these risks. So including those that are experienced by men, women, girls and boys, and groups such as internally displaced older persons, persons with disability, and those belonging to minorities. So they're the expectations, Angaran, that we have for um, partners that we want to work with in a Nexus operation. Perfect, thank you, Paul. Uh, now, I'd like to turn to Agnese. Um, so Agnese, as you are directly involved yourself in the UN's Nexus reforms, could you reflect, as evidenced by the many questions we've received from participants wondering uh, what the current state of these reforms is, um, it's not necessarily such an easy process to follow. Uh, in your view, what is the overall aim of these reforms? How would you express that? And what is the vision that we are trying to move towards uh, with these reforms? Over to you, Agnese. Um, yes, thank you. Um on guard. Um, so just to say, indeed, the UN development uh, system reforms, I wouldn't call it nexus reform, I would just say the development system reforms really, um, as many of you know, um, aims to um, achieve the vision of the 2030 agenda, which um, is about a sustainable, inclusive and, and peaceful societies. Uh, where people fully um, enjoy their rights um, and live in harmony with with the, with the with the nature. So indeed, peop the people and the planet are um, at the core of this of this reforms. And partnerships are really um, a key aspect of how we 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 foresee to uh, to achieve these goals. So the development system reforms really. Uh, aim to get us fit for purpose to achieve that agenda and um, as many of you know uh, I'm not mentioning some of the of the facts or the figures but uh, in in the development context that we have today we are still pretty far uh, towards um, achieving some uh, some of these uh, to achieving this vision and and the sustainable uh, development goals that um, that uh, member states um, agreed um, a few years ago so as, as you all know uh, today we um, we are uh, not on track um, to achieve uh, for example the target of ending global poverty uh, the number of people hungry has increased since 2014, um, they uh, still um, 2 billion people living in countries that are experiencing uh, water stress, 
Uh, last year, in 2018, we had 28 million uh, new displacement recorded due to uh, conflict and natural disasters, uh, in unprecedented more than uh, 70 million people that have been forcibly displaced. Um, so, um, so there are a number of um, areas where we really need to do more and we need really need to do better. So the, the development reform is really a, a way to rethink um, the, um, uh, the way we, we support and, and, and work and collaborate with the countries. So in terms of some of the uh, key issues that I think it's worth uh, mentioning about the reform is first of all the um, the key role of the normative agenda and the focus on prevention. So uh, the, the normative agenda and the focus, for example, on human rights um, is is based on the understanding that for development gains really to be sustainable and, and to achieve the promise of leaving no one behind, we really must shift. Uh, to, 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 a, to a model um, that promotes uh, sustainable development, that peace, promotes peace and, and lives of, of dignity. Um, and uh, a model that really uh, puts the, the, the human rights dimension of, um, you know, of people uh, in, to the center of, of the work we do um, in, in all contexts. Um, so, so this is really a, an important aspect as well as, um, and again related to the prevention uh, component, the need to focus more on, on disaster risk reduction, on early warning, on early action, and, and on preventing really uh, conflicts uh, from, from, uh, from coming up. Uh, and, and the need to, to, to build the resilience to, to external shocks. Um, a second component which I think is key to the reform is the leaving no one behind uh, focus. So indeed, um, we, we do, of course, have the uh, 17 uh, goals uh, that are, um, you know, um, have been, um, as I said, agreed by, by all countries, but in, indeed, um, we, the focus should be to, uh, on, on eradicating poverty in all its forms, uh, on ending um, discrimination and exclusions, on reducing uh, inequality and vulnerabilities, and the, and the leaving no one behind uh, focus of, of the reform really um, aims to, to push focus on, on these issues. Um, the third one I would mention is the economic transformation and, and the uh, strong emphasis by the reform to actually come up with the different economic models um, in the different contexts. Um, that do provide and do create more opportunities for all and so that are more inclusive, um, just and really brings pr prosperity for, for all. Um, and the fourth one that I would mention that of course um, is very much related to the nexus is really the need to, um, to ensure a more cross-pillar approach. So stronger collaboration really across all actors that are present within a country, humanitarian development and peace partners, uh, to really um, tackle what are the underlying uh, vulnerabilities um, and the root causes of needs um, within, within a country. So maybe just to say that this nexus approach um, for us, and when I say for us, I mean for the development community, where I have to say this discussion is not as much advanced as it is in the humanitarian community. Um, it really means an approach and a framework that, of course, acknowledges the imperative of delivering humanitarian uh, uh, life-saving assistance to protect people and, and to save lives, but at the same time, it needs to take into account the long-term needs of the affected populations uh, and, and to and enhance um, opportunities for, for peace. Um, so that's um, really um, a, key, a key part of, uh, uh, this is really what we mean when, when we uh, talk about uh, the nexus. Um, and, and, and just to say that we, even though of course the reformal is global, uh, but we do have different approaches in different contexts. We, we don't have a, uh, and I think we shouldn't have a, a fit, um, one size fits all um, context, but we really need to try to look at the different contexts and how this, 
uh, actually uh, translates in different ways um, in different contexts. Um, and and uh, the reform does um, acknowledge, as I said, the importance of preserving the humanitarian space, um, which should continue to remain a priority um, as well as a humanitarian principle to be able to, um, to save lives, save and protect lives, as um, it was mentioned by Paul. Okay, thank you, Agnese. And um, just to, to follow up on that, what would you say are some of the main processes then that practitioners on the ground should be aware of uh, as things are developing? Mm -hmm. um, okay, the first one that comes to my mind is actually the um, new cooperation frameworks. Uh, these are the development frameworks um, that the UN country teams are uh, developing um, in, in uh, normally in all countries. Um, and uh, between 2020 and 2021, uh, 50 countries will roll out um, new frameworks. So we believe um, this is an opportunity um, really to uh, start doing our work in a different way. And uh, the, the common country analysis that do inform uh, these frameworks um, are meant to be multi-stakeholder analysis, really engaging with all partners uh, in, in a country. Uh, we know and, uh, I mean, we know the, these frameworks are uh, documents and frameworks signed between the UN and the government, but now there is really more emphasis to engage with partners in the process, um, to have, for example, a more comprehensive and multidimensional risk analysis which really identifies what are the, the drivers of humanitarian need and conflict in the countries, the risks the vulnerabilities who identi which identify the populations that are left behind and the reasons why they are left behind and how they are impacted by um, by these um, these drivers um, and and we really feel this should be should be a, a, a very participatory and inclusive process at the country level so I think this is um, one first um, process which is I believe interesting and it's useful to be aware of. Um, and then um, another one would be the cross-pillar uh, collaboration. I've mentioned that already. Um, the more emphasis in the crisis context, particularly and currently we have about 30, 35 countries that do have um, international coordinate, coordinated humanitarian plans. Um, and, uh, and uh, um, uh, in those contexts, we are really trying to uh, push this nexus discussion and engaging with the partners on the ground uh, to, to identify and unpack what, what it means to address risks and vulnerabilities in those contexts. Um, a third one um, that was um, briefly mentioned by Paul in the introduction is the strengthening of the resident coordinator system. Um, as you know, the resident coordinators are the, um, the, the highest, um, let's say, uh, officials for the United Nations country teams in, in, in a country, and many of them are also designated as humanitarian coordinators. Now, um, they, the, the system, the RC system has been, with the reform, has been delinked by UNDP, and they really are focusing on the whole of system, um, let's say, strategies and, and, and visions. So, uh, at the same time, so, so really more dedicated to their roles as, as RCs. Um, at the same time, we uh, do have uh, strengthened uh, resident coordinators' offices, so their offices are being strengthened um, with additional capacity, um, including strategic planners, economists, data management people, uh, but also um, with, uh, uh, for some of them, for, for in, particularly in crisis context, there will be additional advisory support, uh, including on, on prevention, on human rights, on peace and development, on the nexus, depending really on the, on the needs highlighted by the, the RCs. Um, and that's, I think, quite important to, to keep in mind as, 
we are trying really to boost um, the capacities in country. Um, and the fourth one I think may be interesting to know is the reorganization um, of the regional of the UN regional architectures. Um, so we do um, acknowledge, and we all know that um, the drivers of some um, of the humanitarian needs are really regional. We do have also regional, um, let's say, phenomena and trends like migration, human trafficking, transboundary crimes, and others that really require also regional solutions. So we're also looking um, at how to restructure our regional presence to have a more meaningful impact on, on, uh, um, on, on countries' work. Great. Thank you so much for that, Agnese. So I'm going to, to jump ahead here. Uh, so we've talked a bit about the overall vision, um, about the approach of the UN to the nexus and a number of the processes that everyone should be aware of. Uh, but in your view, how does protection then fit into this vision? Mm -hmm. um, as I said, of course, and as it was mentioned by Paul at the beginning, um, in, in, in humanitarian terms, you know, really protection of civilian is a central component of the humanitarian response, um, and, and uh, it should really promote and ensure the, the respect of human rights. When and, and RCs and, and UNCTs do fully uh, recognize and support the need to preserve um, the humanitarian space and um, humanitarian principles uh, to, to save and protect lives in, in, in those settings. Um, when we talk about protection in, in development terms, we are looking um, at uh, um, social protection systems um, that really do help um, you know, individuals and families, in particular the poor and, and the vulnerable uh, ones, uh, to cope with crises and shocks, for example, to find jobs, to, um, to be supported uh, and, and protected in different ways. We do have um, within the, the uh, let's say, in, in development terms, other systems like welfare systems, social services, social safety nets, um, or other sets of policies and programs, um, for example, um, aiming at uh, promoting a decent employment or more inclusive labor market um, and, and protect workers, for example, uh, that could be, uh, could be strengthened um, and, and, and should be really geared towards um, towards addressing, you know, the exclusions and the marginalizations and really trying to, um, to, to support the, the most vulnerable people within the, the communities. So it's, it's important for um, the resident coordinators and the UN country teams when they uh, look, uh, they take a look and they review their work at the country level to really ensure some of these interventions are part of the, um, of the UN system support uh, to the countries to really target the people that are uh, farthest behind or at risk uh, of being left behind. Okay, thank you very much, Agnese. We'll be coming back to you with some follow-up questions. Um, for now, I would like to turn to Carolyn. Uh, Carolyn Kubisarian, head of the unit for the protection of the civilian population with the ICRC. Um, now, Carolyn, as I understand, so although the ICRC may be sitting outside of these, uh, these processes, these reforms uh, that we've been hearing about. Um, I understand that from where you sit in the ICRC, you have been uh, looking, um, looking from the outside at these reforms and, and potentially at their impact on humanitarian protection work. Uh, I'd like to ask, do you share the vision uh, or do you relate to the vision that Agnese has outlined for what the nexus reforms uh, or the, the system reforms should achieve? Over to you. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon again. I think um, what's interesting with the Nexus or the Nexus discussion is that the span of the Nexus becomes uh, something that allows you to reframe or to rethink your protection concerns over time. And I think any uh, protection organization should be able to look at a problem over time, while humanitarian actors might be caught in the um, 
the the immediate crisis and the immediate focus, there is uh, definitely some worth to thinking about how that problem is going to evolve over time, how it's going to transform, and um, what can be done then to respond to it in the immediate, but then how can you make your uh, humanitarian response impactful over time. So I think the discussion is good. Um, I, I will have a bit of trouble kind of uh, relating that directly to the, the architecture or the, the evolving um, developments in the UN system because I'm not sure um, it, it's all there yet and, and, and that the comments we can make um, can be concrete. But in terms of the thinking of how you conceptualize protection problems, I think uh, there's something to be said about the span of the nexus. Now, I, I've, whether it's in this discussion or more broadly, the security part of that span is being tacked on. Uh, I would start to pose questions as to what we mean by security when we talk about the nexus. So we say peace, and then sometimes we're adding security. Are we talking about human security, uh, security sector reform? Uh, and depending what we precisely mean with regards to security, th there could be a set of questions and challenges to whether that's relevant in the uh, the nexus debates, so I think uh, we should be careful around that and, and it would be up to first the people um, around the architecture of the nexus to think through what they mean on security. Then I think um, where Agnes was making a point about, um, sorry, I'll, first I'll go into, I think not only framing protection problems across the span is interesting, but it allows you also to bring in all the actors that are involved, whether it's with regards to humanitarian crisis or development or down the line to uh, a peace discussion, you're bringing certain actors closer to uh, very key problem sets for individuals, for communities that are impacted by these different um, moments, and you're bringing them closer to uh, the problem set and perhaps bringing them in to responsibilize them a bit more with regards to why the situation is as it is. So there's a there's a interesting potential to responsibilize, to change a bit the the way we've set out our roles and responsibilities um, in these different sectors and to sort of renegotiate, if you will, or to um, redimension the problem to, to have a different set of actors involved in resolving problems. But I think with all these, uh, with these two potential opportunities, there are a set of challenges that need to be um, paid attention to. Um, we'll, we'll get to a question around principles, but I think uh, just if we're thinking about architecture and the ambitions behind uh, achieving the SDGs, uh, there was an interesting point made uh, from Yezi about um, making sure that we leave no one behind. I think leaving no one behind is a very important concept. It could be akin to making sure you have a very neutral and impartial work in the humanitarian world. Um, but it will depend as to how that is understood, framed, and unpacked, and how then the development understanding of um, leaving no one behind or the peace understanding of leaving no one behind matches up with um, humanitarian principles of getting to the, the most vulnerable populations um, and addressing them, whether they're you know individuals, uh, communities, or larger populations. And I think that leaving no one behind aspect um, should eventually be put up further uh, up the list in terms of priorities so that it doesn't get overridden by um, ambitions to just have collective outcomes or collective mechanisms, but that the leaving no one behind is kind of the drive uh, for the activities. And perhaps here, this is where GPC uh, would have a role to make sure that um, uh, if, if it's termed leaving behind, uh, it really means that there are certain populations who maybe, if you're looking at it from a security paradigm, would actually be cast aside because they were, uh, whether you want to call them the perpetrators or the opposition group or the fighters, um, in a conflict setting, they still have rights and um, they still have uh, needs as well. 
and so while uh, if you're at the far end of the spectrum, you may have a tendency to discard them because you're thinking through maybe the authorities' um, prism, you still have to ensure that leaving no one behind means uh, leaving no one behind. So perhaps there's a role there for GPC, perhaps the resident coordinator, maybe he's becoming unattached from several of the um, former um, outcomes that were expected so that he has a much broader perspective, but I would suggest that there should be some incentivizing around certain aspects, and if, if uh, we come to some common ground by saying leaving no one behind is really a driving factor, then some incentivization should go there. So those are some initial thoughts. Excellent. Thanks so much, Carolyn. Uh, so in the questions that have come in from participants in the event, we've had a lot of people expressing concern related to principled humanitarian action in the context of the nexus. Um, and for example, Emmanuel in Turkey uh, asking, to what extent is principled humanitarian action at risk of being compromised as a result of nexus-related uh, system reforms? Do you have any thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. um, so I have a few thoughts. I think ITRC is still elaborating or defining its position with regards to the nexus. Um, so Definitely, this is not a, a firm position or a firm word from ICRC, but definitely there is a question of preserving uh, principled action, preserving the principles, um, preserving humanitarian space, if you will, making sure we're able to act, uh, again, for these most vulnerable populations um, in an effective, in an as effective way as possible. And I think um, even in Paul's opening, when he spoke about sort of the six actions that GPC would be uh, undertaking, he mentioned that there is a question about what happens when you work with authorities, and does that cause uh, a problem for being able to uh, engage in a humanitarian action? I don't think it's the question about engaging with authorities, because, I, I mean, ICRC and when many others do protection work, they raise the responsibilities of the authorities, uh, the weapon bearers, with regards to uh, protecting populations. So there must be an engagement with uh, the authorities. There must be, for, from our point of view, transparency with the authorities that you do want to raise um, those protection questions. You do want to raise the responsibility with regards to rights that are established in different legal frameworks. So there will always be this exchange uh, with authorities. But the question is, how are you coming at that uh, discussion? How are you presenting yourself? And how is your work framed? What is the perception that, whether it's the state authorities or um, other armed groups, weapon bearers, what, how do they perceive your work? And do they understand you as neutral? If they understand you as neutral, they are going to be much more willing to understand that you are there to respond to the vulnerabilities or the, the needs of the, the most uh, dire populations. If they believe you're coming with a political agenda and that starts to get to attach to the peace and definitely the security um, aspects of this uh, nexus, you're going to have a lot of difficulty convincing them that you're just there to answer to the immediate needs of the population in this crisis or conflict type situation. So. Right there and then, um, by being linked to the nexus, you have a challenge with regards to your perception and your neutrality and how the organizations involved in this sort of uh, movement uh, deal with that will be a big question um, that, that will need to be addressed, I think, over, over time as this uh, system gets articulated. Now... Yeah, so b before we move on, um, just a, a final question for the moment. Um, are there any, so one of the, the, the biggest concerns, uh, as I mentioned, that people have raised is related to principled humanitarian action. Are there any other concerns or risks related to um, the Nexus, Nexus reforms or uh, Nexus initiatives um, that, that, you've, um, that you've observed, that you've heard uh, discussed um, uh, when it comes to uh, meeting protection needs? Mm -hmm. I think I can highlight uh, two different ones that I would see in the immediate. One would be about um, how this actually plays out in in uh, different 
conflict contexts or different contexts that are protracted uh, conflicts where there there's these mix of actors. Um, these are issues that are present today, but that definitely will be even more intensified uh, as you move towards a, a nexus movement. Is uh, so this pressure to become part of joint activities, to whether it's to to have uh, common outcomes for the no leaving behind or for some other ambitions. Um, in in crisis situations, it's very difficult to be as coherent as we would all like to be in terms of uh, logically minded human beings. In conflict situations, things are patchy. Um, understanding of protection problems come from different angles, different voices, and trying having an ambition for hyper coherence might um, break that down in terms of the iterative process for getting to what is the real protection concern, how do we manage to work on it uh, with different voices, different added value. And on that added value point, uh, different organizations having different added value, I would add that uh, in an extreme case, the nexus ambition might push uh, humanitarian actors to depending on who's managing the architecture, and that's another big uh, question as to how this architecture will, will sort of, um, who will have an overall view of it. But if uh, humanitarian actors, because their added value is their ability to reach out to uh, non-state armed groups, non-state actors, into the more dangerous areas, so more far-flung geographical areas as well, Will humanitarian action then be cantoned to those areas and the populations that would need the humanitarian type response or the protection lens of the humanitarian action in bigger cities, in, in um, safer areas, but yet where populations are maybe stigmatized or not necessarily all considered um, equally in terms of their rights? Will those be forgotten because the development processes tend to be development piece tend to be bigger processes that see populations as whole groups, whereas humanitarian action maybe spends a bit more time on the individuals, uh, individual problems that are very specific and then pushing them up into into the light, into the discussion. So we have to be careful to not canton uh, smaller, agile humanitarian action to far off places, whereas Bigger structural responses are left in areas where there are more structure, where there's more structure, bigger cities and so on. Um, then there's a question about the law. So, you know, ICRC is uh, very attached to the law when we speak about international humanitarian law, but also other, other frameworks and so are other protection agencies. Um, if you run the spectrum, the IHL set of laws is obviously very close to the humanitarian action. And as you move further out to development or peace, that that set of law tends to diminish in terms of its um, in terms of its importance because other frameworks may take um, a wider space. But uh, if we try to be hyper coherent or or continually having common objectives, there may be even more confusion as to which laws apply, how to how to approach them, the different sets of laws that are sometimes interplaying with each other, and thus the rights that, that go with those laws and the rights that go towards those vulnerable populations. And we'll have to be careful of um, how that plays out as well. Great. Thanks so much, Carolyn. So we will uh, hopefully, again, be coming back to you in a few minutes. Um, for some follow-up questions, we've we've already had some great ones come in on the principles, so I, I do hope we have time to to come back to you on those. Um, so now turning to Ralph Mamia, executive in residence with the GCSP. Ralph, having worked on protection and peacekeeping during your time with the DPKO, I wonder if you could reflect um, for us a bit. So peace and security are relatively new additions, um, as we've heard, to the nexus discussions compared to development and humanitarian work. Having heard the visions and perspectives uh, outlined by Anese and Carolyn, did these resonate with you from a peacekeeping perspective on protection? Over to you, Ralph. 
Thanks so much. Um, so yes, the, this discussion certainly resonates, um, and, and I think as as Paul mentioned in the beginning, uh, it, it, it's not necessarily a new discussion. Um, peace and security um, may be new additions to the nexus, um, but these issues have been sort of around us for for a very long time. I'm sure. Uh, many colleagues listening um, are, you know, engaged with either with peacekeepers or with um, with political officers uh, who view humanitarian or development workers as, um, you know, sometimes as, you know, if not part of their organizations, then at least as, uh, you know, a very close um, collaborators. Uh, that may not always be true. It may not always be an, an appreciated um, um, uh, attitude, but it's it's certainly one that you encounter a lot. So I don't think, you know, if if you talk to the average peacekeeper, um, he may be more surprised that this is a new conversation rather than something that's been going on for some time. Um, now, uh, and I think that it, it's had a bit of a checkered history. Um, you know, I can remember uh, being engaged in discussions around integration and um, what we called early early recovery um, on the development side, you know, a, a decade or so ago. Um, and those efforts uh, bore some fruit in some cases and, and less in others. I mean, I think the main lesson I can recall from this um, is both not to be too vague, um, you know, not to make the idea of, of nexus or integration too aspirational, um, but also on the other side, not to make it too technical. Um, that, uh, you know, I've been involved in lots of integrated strategic frameworks and various other planning documents. It's very easy to take this merely as an issue of planning. Um, and I think that, um, you know, it really does have to to go deeper than that. Um, also, drawing on experience from integration and UN missions, um, you know, there th th that is an issue that at the policy level is pretty well agreed between um, DPKO, now DPO, uh, and, and, the, and the UN humanitarian system. Um, on the ground, again, as I'm sure many listeners will recognize, it is much more fraught. Um, and that comes out of a few areas uh, that I think are going to be very relevant to, to the nexus. Um, you know, when we have discussions with our counterparts, uh, you know, on, on the other side, um, you know, those can be, those conversations can happen at a normative level, at, you know, a, a level of principles. Um, a level of, of what you might call professional expertise, um, and then a very, you know, sort of nuts and bolts um, tactical level. And, you know, I think most of the time um, when we have these discussions on the ground, what we're really looking for is a nuts and bolts discussion of how, you know, how we work together to get from point A to point B. Um, but what very often happens is this conversation escalates um, both to the, you know, a level of professional expertise and then quite frequently to a level of norms and principles. Um, and of course, when you get to the discussion of principles, it becomes very difficult to resolve these questions, um, you know, just in a meeting. Um, and when it comes to protection, I think, um, as well as, as Carolyn mentioned, security, you know, these are issues that both humanitarians and um, certainly peacekeepers, uh, you know, feel they have some expertise in. Um, the peacekeepers, particularly military, will often think of protection as being, you know, what they do um, and, and security is what they do. Whereas, um, as I'm sure this audience knows well, uh, protection is a core humanitarian competency um, and also uh, uh, humanitarian organizations are very adept at providing security for their own staff in a manner that's very different from the way that uh, a peacekeeping mission would do the same. So, uh, you know, I, re reflecting on that experience, I think there, there are some lessons to draw on the history we have of, exper of integration in the UN system. Um, I think, you know, and in, in the context of the nexus, I think this can work. We just have to avoid some of the, the difficulties we faced in the past.
Okay, thanks a lot, Ralph. Um, so we uh, we often hear concerns from a humanitarian perspective about protection being somehow overlooked as a result of greater and increasing integration. Um, However, of course, many peacekeeping operations have explicit protection mandates. Are there similar concerns in that sector, or, or, is, it a, or is it a different story? Uh, back to you, Ralph. Sure. Um, I, don't think, I don't think that peacekeeping operations feel threatened by the nexus, um, perhaps in the same way that some humanitarian or, or development actors do. Um, they're, Peacekeeping is threatened by by other dynamics in 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 the world right now, um, including sort of a, a loss of, of multilateral cooperation and increasingly shrinking budgets. Um, but uh, you know, protection in peacekeeping has always been has always been focused on coordination, and in that respect, I think it has a great deal in common with the nexus. Um, if the nexus um, is you know in in large part about ensuring a degree of of common effort between different organizations then i think it's very much in line with with the core concept of the protection of civilians in un peacekeeping um uh and i think it's going to be increasingly important with regard to, to transitions um a lot of our large missions are downsizing um and you know in that context the question of how you continue to have a protective effect either with less troops or no troops um, and having those functions taken over by the UN country team or by other protection actors um, becomes much more important. Got it. Thank you. And uh, again, hoping to come back to you with some follow-up questions in a few minutes. Um, but now turning to Natasha Rykoff, Chair of the Conflict Analysis Network. Natasha, um, many of the contexts in which uh, the nexus reforms are focusing are, um, are protracted crises where there is an ongoing conflict. And yourself, having worked on overall conflict security and political analysis of crisis response, response contexts, you've already had the opportunity, I think, to approach the humanitarian development peace and security sectors um, together as a whole, um, to look at them holistically. So first question to you, do you share the views that you've heard so far from the other speakers today regarding the overall need, the, the promise um, of the nexus reforms? Over to you, Natasha. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what I was going to say is, is one of the themes that's come out today is really familiar to me, and that's making the double points, one, that there is nothing new about the nexus, um, which, which I think virtually everyone has mentioned, and, and there's not. Clearly, we've been operating in these very complex environments for a long time, where inevitably all of the different intervention types butt up against each other and, and interact. But at the same time, I, I think it was um, Agnese who said, I don't think development is as far advanced as the humanitarians in the conversation on the nexus. All of the players that I speak to say the same thing. And I'm not sure that it's not that there hasn't been a lot of thinking. It's just that this is, is very complex. And so having neat, um, simple to articulate answers is, is not where we're at yet. And, and that, for me, is a real um, opportunity in terms of those who are concerned by any kind of threat from, from the nexus. But I think it's also interesting, um, I'm sure we'll talk about principles, but it's also interesting to talk about um, opportunities. So I hope we come back to that as well. Um, what, one of the interesting things that's been, interest, been noteworthy from my, my point of view is I do work very much in the political world. And we, we've hardly heard the word political used. Um, and I, I understand that's got a lot of baggage for the humanitarian community. But in, in many ways, if you're talking about um, peace and security, you're, you're looking at another one of the pillars of UN reform and the, the peace and security reform, which is going alongside our, our development partners. And if you listen to, to the words sort of coming from the Secretary General's office, he does talk about um, a hierarchy where the political objective is being put first. Now, that 
is really interesting for those who operate on the ground because there's different ways to think about a political um, objective. There, there's a political agenda that might be, be carried out and something that we're obviously not looking to be um, part This of. conference appears to be inactive and will be ended soon. If you're the host and wish this conference to continue, please press any key on your telephone touchpad. The need for political literacy. So a, a lot of the, the things that we're talking about, I think, today is if we're going to understand where, where the interactions are, if we're going to understand the transitions that, that Ralph was just talking about and the handovers as peace missions are, are shutting down, if we're going to understand uh, the communities that we're dealing with and we really want to empower them and their voices, I mean, using some of that localization jargon, do we understand who they are? I, I think some of the work coming from uh, UNDP looking at really enhancing um, country analysis is, is great, but, but we also have to be aware that a UN document um, sponsored or co-sponsored by, by a state who is almost inevitably party to the conflict is going to come at it in kind of some kind of a sanitized form. So what, what else are we doing um, to complement those things? I think is, is going to be a really important part of the way forward. Um, it's also interesting to, to, to look at who are, who are our natural partners, who is our community when we're involved in conflict? Who do we have more and less ease of reaching out to? If you're talking about the UN system um, trying to operate in in Syria, for example, reaching out to Russian or Iranian partners was much more complex than reaching out to um, US coalition partners in the northeast of the country. If we're going to operate in this kind of nexus ways, those linkages need to be stronger. And then, of course, if we're starting to talk about non-state armed groups or non-state actors, I'm, I'm not uh, sure what the, the best terms being used at the moment are. We need to be understanding those a lot better. Um, so there's a lot of good process thinking going on, um, but now to translate that into to really concrete actions of things that we can do is, is probably um, a, a bit of a next step. And in some ways, I like the idea of having a toolbox where we can look at the sorts of ways that the humanitarians and the protection community might like to, to interact. Some of it is very naturally leaking between stovepipes. Um, some of it will be... Your microphone has been turned on. Sorry, go ahead, Natasha. Apologies Sorry, for the background. A couple of little messages there. I hope that's uh, not, yeah. not disconcerting. Um, Sorry, I lost my train there a little bit, but yeah. So, so really, going back to say, practically, what do we want to do? What might we want to do? And it's not just about looking at joint programming. It's about what what does the protection community want from those other pillars? What things can they support us with, as well as what can we support them with? And then I think having some of those concrete examples, concrete proposals, might be a, a useful way forward in then contextualizing to, to specific operations to make sure that the, we, we are looking at the risks and we are looking at the reality of, of each context in its own right. It's okay, so a quick follow-up question for you, Natasha, and apologies for the, um, the the background noise there. I know that was distracting. Um, there was a question raised by Carolyn a few minutes ago um, regarding what what we mean by security when um, when we're talking about, I guess, uh, potentially a quadruple nexus, then um, bringing security into the mix of discussion in the conversations that that you've had. Um, uh, in that arena, uh, how, how do you see the concept of security uh, sometimes being brought in? What is what is meant by that then? Yeah, it, it, it was a really good point by, by by Carolyn. Mostly, when I hear people talking in the nexus context, they are talking about the the peace and security pillar in the in the UN framing of that. But if I talk to people on the ground, security means everything from um, fighting in the streets to non-state armed groups to international actors coming in. 
um, trying to cooperate with uh, international coalitions, trying to cooperate with national armies. So it can mean a lot of things to different people. Um, and again, I'd, I'd go back to saying that if we do end up with the, the peace and security um, idea from the UN context, in many ways, what we're, we're also talking about there is, is the political. And, and it's trying to find um, ways to ensure that that understanding is brought in as well. Not that I want to add another layer to the, um, the multi, multi-layered nexus, but um, it's difficult to talk about these issues uh, without talking about the political. Got it. Thank you very much. And yes, I, I do hope we'll have time to to come back to you um, to discuss the uh, opportunities uh, among other things. Um, now, I'd like to turn to William, uh, William Chamali, Global Protection Cluster Coordinator. Uh, now, William, we have heard from the other panelists about their views on the nexus from a variety of different perspectives. Um, as um, these system reforms uh, and various processes have been ongoing for some time and, and discussions around the humanitarian development nexus in one way or another have been around, as it's been pointed out, for decades, um, how is the GPC currently approaching this conversation uh, from its end? And what role for the GPC and what kind of support um, uh, was identified um, uh, that the GPC could potentially provide uh, that was needed by other actors in the sector um, as a part of the current strategic framework. Um, what, what's the, the current state of, of, of discussion there? Over to you, William. Thanks uh, very much, Angar, uh, and uh, it's an excellent discussion. There is also a big shout I would like to, to put out for the chat uh, people on the side. I see a parallel full-on discussion is also happening by Huda, Randa, Mark, Christophe, and others. So it's very interesting. Please keep it up, guys. Angar, indeed, the focus of uh, humanitarian development peace uh, joint up approach or nexus has evolved uh, i think it's true and i like the double point uh, uh, that uh, uh, that you mentioned natasha uh, has evolved in focus over the last time even though it existed for a while i think we started with a lot of focus on effectiveness of aid and then handover from a humanitarian to development and peace uh, there was a period where the focus was on sustainability and the joint action. Uh, but I think what's different now uh, in the conversation and the narrative is uh, is to talk about a joint action towards uh, shared goals. And uh, the UN SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, are used as a reference point as well as a conflict uh, prevention and, and sustaining peace agendas. And uh, my views uh, so far from the consultation that we've had is actually that the weight and influence of development policy and development actors over the Nexus discussion is very strong. Uh, and that might uh, be based on the size of the operations in terms of uh, resources between development action, peace action that, uh, uh, that is on the ground and, uh, and the humanitarian one. Uh, so the way we approach it is actually that we argue that the humanitarian part of the nexus is uh, is of equal importance. Uh, and I like the point raised by Caroline of keeping the, uh, the idea of um, leaving no one behind up there. Uh, I would add to it as well the, the centrality of protection. Of course, protection should remain central to humanitarian action. But I think when there is a, a coexistence between the different approach, we see that protection is at least essential uh, to development and peace agendas. So when it comes to how the GPC is, is approaching all of this, I would like to, to, to raise four, four points. First, I think we should engage positively. There's a lot of opportunities uh, with, the, uh, with the enthusiasm behind this. We shouldn't be naive, but I think the, uh, the potential uh, opportunities that this uh, uh, approach and momentum, political momentum to, uh, to bring some of the efforts uh, is uh, uh, important. But we should also together remember that joining up is not a one-off choice. 
it's not like we join the nexus or not for the coming 10 years. It's a choice that evolves over time. Uh, and, and of course, we should, as protection actors, follow protection objectives. And sometimes there are opportunities uh, in having a rapprochement with other approaches or uh, sharing information or sharing plans or joining analysis with others. And sometimes, indeed, we should have a, a hardcore principle, the humanitarian distant action from, uh, from any other approach indeed to preserve access and be able to reach those who are left most uh, uh, most behind so our first uh, my first element of the answer is we should engage positively and remember that it is a choice that can uh, evolve over time depending on how our reading of protection problems are evolving the second element is uh, this is another opportunity for us to uh, to double up our effort on promoting centrality of protection and international humanitarian law. The dimension that uh, coexistence of different approaches in one geographic area or one country uh, from development to peace to, to humanitarian gives uh, the importance of centrality of protection and the international humanitarian law and promoting it a new dimension, a wider dimension, uh, if, if I'm allowed to say. Uh, I think uh, that gives us uh, uh, an important role of explaining uh, protection to actors that, uh, from our perspective, that probably read protection in, in a different way, but also uh, n not only look at the long-term perspective uh, to engage in this. For example, big part of uh, protection work and international humanitarian law uh, advocacy rests on the way the hostilities are conducted uh, when the war is raging. And I think the way the war is conducted or the conflict is conducted has a massive impact on the civilian infrastructure, on the, uh, on the protection humanitarian work, but also on the long-term development work. And I think engaging with, a, uh, uh, with uh, the actors that are supporting uh, uh, parties to the conflict uh, on reminding them on their protection responsibilities and international humanitarian law responsibilities is, uh, is crucial even at this very early stage, even in a preventive way uh, before the, the conflict starts. So the point I'm raising here is that we, uh, uh, we see this nexus uh, narrative as an opportunity to reconfirm centrality of protection and international humanitarian law. And we see it at all stages uh, and not only waiting uh, uh, until uh, protraction kicked, kicks in and we need to start thinking long term. We can actually start from the beginning. The third point I would like to make is that uh, when we have interaction between uh, humanitarian uh, and specifically protection uh, work and development and peace work. This puts more pressure on a really uh, joint up uh, and non-fragmented protection approach in a crisis. In many operations around the world, we see uh, 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 the, the reading of what are the major protection issues and the approach to address them becomes sometimes a, a space of tension between protection and a humanitarian act. Uh, this is something that needs to be resolved. Of course, every actor should retain their added value and their, their philosophy of attaining things. We're not calling on, uh, on one approach, but I think the, the whole, uh, uh joint up uh, approach beyond the humanitarian sector calls on the humanitarian house and the human and the protection house specifically uh, to have a, a continuous uh, uh, talk and interaction among each other, joint up analysis and real focus on uh, uh, reading uh, the problems in a way that brings all perspectives and makes us uh, read the problems with a uh, with as comprehensive angle as uh, as possible together. So that would summarize my third point, which is fragmentation of protection sector uh, becomes under harsher uh, attention uh, when we're talking about peace development, a humanitarian joint up approach, and we should double up our effort to to come together as a uh, as a sector in this environment. And finally, um, 
I think operationally we we should focus on our added value, uh, and our added value could uh, be summed up with us being there and remaining on the front lines. Uh, we should uh, retain this proximity uh, to to the uh, to the people we try to serve, as well as uh, the armed actors and other stakeholders, uh, and uh, you know keep that uh, that edge, that concrete added value that uh, that we bring to the dialogue alive and uh, and relevant and strong. Because otherwise, we'll uh, we'll lose ground in in bringing these uh, principles of protection and the humanitarian action uh, to the table. Right. Thank you very much, William. Um, we're now going to uh, turn to my colleague Marcus Forsberg. So as you all saw when registering, we ran a survey for the participants in this webinar to help inform both the webinar and the GPC strategic planning process. So again, a big thank you to everyone who completed that, and it will be a critical input into not only today's discussion, but the, the rest of the process. I'd like to turn now to Marcus to provide you with a very brief overview of the results. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you, Anherd. Um, so just to point out, as, as Anherd said, this is a very brief overview. We'll be putting together these results in a report and we'll be sharing with you uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but the, the purpose was, uh, was both to look at the overall views uh, of the Nexus reforms uh, and to identify specific protection gaps and challenges related to the Nexus. Um, the, the, here I'll only look at, the, at the, um, the overall views of Nexus reforms and we will be looking at the specific protection gaps and challenges in the report. So very briefly about respondents. So we had 425 uh, respondents of you, so, so close to half of the registrants. Uh, based in 75 countries with a quite even gender balance um, and also a, a quite representative organizational spread of the sector, uh, but with a bit more of international NGOs perhaps than, than, than other, uh, other types of organizations, and a pretty much perfect split between those with an, with an international or regional uh, geographic scope of their work, uh, or those who primarily are working at the national level. Um, important also to keep in mind is that the, the majority here were uh, had the humanitarian sector as their primary sector that they identified with, um, but as we saw, there were also many of you who uh, have, have experience of development, peace, and some of security as well. Um, the majority with a, with a primary focus on protection. Uh, almost everyone else said it was relevant, but not their primary focus. So looking at the results, first of all, it was um, clear that that most of you, uh, close to, to, well, even uh, more than 70%, has already seen humanitarian action become either somewhat more integrated or a lot more integrated. Um, so with that in mind, then asking, asking you then how Nexus reforms to date um, have, uh, have affected uh, protection, then there was um, Interesting, an, an overall positive view of the effects to date, uh, both in terms of protection outcomes and protection gaps. But it was most of you, or, or almost a majority, uh, did not even have a strong opinion about this, what has happened to date. Um, importantly, to keep in mind is that more than 20% actually had negative views of how Nexus reforms to date have affected protection. Then we also asked um, how the, the outcome here in, for, the, for the future, how, how you think that the, uh, that the future Nexus reforms will affect protection. Um, here we saw a much um, more positive view. Um, 
both in this question where we asked people to, to place themselves on a spectrum, uh, whether they saw it as an opportunity or a risk for protection. Uh, and here you can see a, a strong skew to the left here, so, so towards an opportunity. Uh, we saw a similar um, result when we asked about outcomes and gaps, um, a much uh, stronger stronger majority thought uh, that that uh, the nexus reforms will, would lead to overall stronger protection outcomes and not lead to worsen gaps in protection. Then I'll finally looking at, at a few more nuanced questions as well. Um, we saw that, that more than 40% of respondents thought that humanitarian assistance would benefit more than protection from nexus reforms. Um, we also had close to 30 percent uh, thinking that this might lead to principled humanitarian actors disconnecting from the rest of the sector, uh, but we did have fewer who thought that nexus reforms would lead to restricted access for protection activities. So this was just a, a very brief overview of, of a few of the questions, uh, and we'll be returning to the rest of them in the, in the report. Yes, yeah, thanks so much, Marcus. It is, um, it's very interesting to see uh, the degree of optimism uh, among respondents when it comes to the future. So having been either on the fence or, or maybe a bit negative when it comes to, to reforms or changes to date, but having uh, really overall a very uh, positive and optimistic outlook for the potential in the future, again, going to those uh, opportunities um, that, that Natasha mentioned, um, there are, of course, as Marcus mentioned at the end, um, some uh, potential challenges uh, there that, that uh, we can dig into in future events related to access, related to uh, potentially uh, skewing uh, towards assistance uh, 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 rather, than, rather than protection um, uh, in the dynamic, um, but overall a very, a very optimistic outlook. Um, and again, we'll be uh, sharing some of the, um, the actual practical examples uh, that came as part of the survey responses as well in the report. So uh, now as we are starting to run very short on time, um, we're going to, uh, I'd like to ask Paul, actually uh, my co-facilitator, to give a brief summary of, of what we've heard over the last hour and a half, some of the key points that have come out, and then I'm going to uh, go around the panel uh, one more time to, to, ask, to ask each of our panelists, um, just in, uh, in 30 seconds, if you could select a single priority for the Global Protection Cluster to focus on as they're contemplating uh, the strategy for the next few years, what would that be uh, from your perspective? So first over to Paul to give us a few key points. Thank you very much. Let me just run through a few of the key takeaways. I said at the start that um, we want to look at things that will help us guide the work of the protection, global protection cluster over the next five years. I think one thing is uh, ensuring that our protection clusters and our members of our global protection cluster are fit for purpose. That's one issue that's come out um, several times. This discussion about leave no one behind, I think there's a lot of work to be done there. It's a classic thing that should be done um, by, by the GPC. So we can work on that and incorporate that in various ways into our framework. Um, another thing that's come out to me is that the DPC has a responsibility to be able to articulate pertinent issues within this nexus debate um, to reduce the confusion. So we need to basically define frameworks and understand roles better. And that's clearly something that come, can come from our level. Uh, in, in consultation and discussions with our partners in the field. Um, development is not as far advanced on protection. This is very much a message that I think William and I got in recent discussions in New York, that we are far ahead on protection issues, and it's good if we can um, ensure that uh, we work closely. My colleague from ProCap, Carolyn Blay, did some very good work on solutions with UNDP and incorporate a lot of protection into one area of their work. But there's a lot to be done there, and I think we can identify other areas to work with them on. Um, 
I think the other key thing that's come out that if we are working on tools, toolboxes, it needs to be quite particular and contextualize for a particular space. We're not necessarily going to work across the whole nexus the whole of the time, but we might need to identify those areas uh, that we think we can have most impact in. So for me, there are some very uh, great takeaways from this uh, discussion so far, but I know there are many more that I'll be looking forward to going through in more detail in the question and answers. Thanks a lot. Thanks so much, Paul. Um, so now, as I mentioned, I'd like to go around our panel one more time. I'm going to go uh, here in the, the reverse order. So starting with William, um, could you uh, could you share with us, William, maybe a few points uh, regarding um, the GPC briefly uh, and uh, where you see um, uh, the key opportunities for the future? And then we'll go uh, around to the other panelists. Over to you, William. Thanks a lot, Angard. I think uh, the first uh, key uh, uh, takeaway is that uh, we there is a, a need for for policy clarification and conceptual clarification of how do we uh, interact with with the nexus, and I think that's a first role for the uh, for the GPC to to take on to to create a platform to clarify the the policy direction and. Uh, and the conceptual direction in this. The second is really understanding the structural impact uh, of these Nexus platforms on the ground and, and concretely how will that work in countries that are taking on the Nexus approach and where the development reform is, uh, is happening. How do we as uh, uh, protection actors uh, interact with these structures. Uh, what are the entry points? When is the planning happening? How do we engage in the analysis, etc.? And I think we have an important role here to to understand how this is evolving uh, and uh, uh, and clarify for our partners on the ground in the clusters at national level and subnational level on how to interact with. The third is really uh, understanding the operational impact of uh, of the Nexus approach when it's applied. Uh, I think this is uh, where we need to build on a lot of the existing knowledge of our partners, a, a matter that Paul mentioned at the beginning, but also uh, uh, seeing how, how operations are being shaped or evolving or changed uh, in the coming years, uh, what are the opportunities and the challenges there, and make us smarter uh, uh, operationally uh, by, by way of observation and sharing. And finally, I think there is a lot of capacity building and, uh, uh, and sharing the, the knowledge that is being accumulated and built over the coming years. One for the, for the protection side on how to engage with that, but I'm sure also for the development and peace actors of how to interact with us uh, when it comes to protection issues. Over back to you, Angad. Okay. Thanks a lot, William, and, and thanks so much for being a part of the conversation today. And, and we're looking forward to continuing uh, the, the collaboration uh, uh, that we've started now today. Um, now, I'd like to um, uh, I'd like to ask. Natasha, uh, could you come in, Natasha, uh, just briefly, um, uh, as I mentioned, if you could choose a single priority for the GPC um, to focus on from your perspective, what, what would be the one? Over to you, Natasha. I'm going to cheat a little bit and, and say capacity building, um, but, but I, I would like that capacity building to be up and out, if you like, to, to hit the other parts of the nexus. and influence how they act, ensure they understand what, what the protection um, community would like to see happen. But I'd also like that capacity building to be down to improve our ability to understand the context that we're, we're operating in so that when we use phrases like do no harm and, and leave nobody behind, we actually understand whether we're achieving those goals or not. That's excellent. Thank you so much, and, and thanks for being part of our panel today. It's been great to have you on the line. And uh, now to Ralph, turning to you for your one priority for the, the GPC from your perspective, what would you, what would that be? Over to you, Ralph. Sure. I'm going to, I'm going to choose two, but they're related and actually related to Natasha's as well. The first is really leadership. Um, you know, I, I mentioned that this, the nexus is something you don't want to be too vague about, but you also don't want to be too technical about because both of them 
um, can cannot can get you nowhere. Um, what you know, one important role that GPC could serve is you know providing that you know external monitor um, for a country that is engaging in nexus work. Uh, to make sure that the nexus isn't just doesn't just become a talking point, but also doesn't become you know just a bunch you know another log frame on paper, um, that it should really be adding value. And and sometimes coming in from the outside, when you're not part of the country team, you know um, it can really be uh, you know it can really be important. The second I would say is is kind of an advocate. Um, internally within the UN, um, I would say that, um, you know, when it comes to, on the peace and security side, uh, in peacekeeping, um, now the Department of Peace Operations, um, they're very well sensitized to issues of protection. Um, their counterparts over at the Department of um, Political and Peacebuilding Affairs are much less so. Um, and even though the uh, the DPPA um, missions, and they, they include missions like Afghanistan, Somalia, Colombia. Uh, these are, are countries and contexts with major protection issues, um, but they are very averse to discussing protection. Um, and I think engaging them on protection and you know discussing how uh, their missions can contribute to overall protection goals would be a really important role. Excellent. Thanks so much. And uh, thanks to you, Ralph, for being a part of the conversation and uh, look forward to, to having you in another event soon. Uh, in fact, our course coming up on protection uh, at the end of next month. So very much looking forward to, to having you there. Um, I just want to make a note before I turn uh, to Caroline that we're also inviting all of the participants um, in the webinar to share their own recommendation for priority for the GPC. So please do take a moment moment, everyone who's online, um, to share your own thoughts. And again, we can uh, compile that in the report and, and share that with the GPC for their process as well. Uh, okay, so now to Caroline, over to you. Um, what are your thoughts regarding key priorities for the GPC as they consider the next phase of their work? Over to you. Um, yes, I'll go back to the um, point I made about uh, leaving no one behind, so unpacking that and seeing as much as possible how that can uh, match what, you know, target populations or affected populations look like for a humanitarian sector worker, and then uh, does that make sense in the development world, uh, log frames and planning and so on? Um, can we speak to each other and make sure that we essentially do not leave anyone behind? Uh, and then adding on to that, I would say helping with uh, figuring out what type of information a humanitarian sector-like organization can bring out and what will be valuable to the development type actors so that really we end up uh, being able to speak the same language and we can point to issues that will really feed uh, the planning process in a development type um, organization. Great. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, thank you for being part of our panel today and looking forward to the next opportunity. And uh, last but not least, Agnese, I'd like to turn to you uh, from your perspective. What would you share as a priority for the work of the GPC moving forward? Um, I would actually mention the, the need and importance to focus on content context specificity um, and ensure, of course, that regardless of the broader strategy and, and approach that is going, you know, to be um, adopted um, over the next years, um, it's very important to ensure that, um, you know, we, 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 we are aware and we acknowledge that there are different models and different practices that do apply to different contexts. And um, actually generalizing is sometimes not very helpful and we really need to take into account the issues within, um, within a, given, a given country. And I just have a reflection um, maybe also based on, on what of the messages, some of the messages I've seen in, um, 
in the chat, which is about the importance of financing, which we have not really, really covered here, which is fine. But for me, it's important to keep in mind that um, as concerns developing, uh, developing financing in crisis context, 77% of the ODA is channeled bilaterally. Um, so, uh, and this goes back to what Natasha said about the, the political dimension as well of this discussion and the importance for us working on the nexus really to engage better and more uh, with, uh, with the donors. Right. Thank you so much, Agnese, um, and thanks to all of our panelists for their contributions today. It's been an incredibly rich discussion, um, not only in the audio uh, with the panel, but also, as has been mentioned in the chat, uh, really a lot going on here. We had a lot of questions coming in as well, which unfortunately we simply didn't have time to deal with today. However, the good news is we have two more webinars coming up as a part of this consultation consultation process, and uh, I see that it, a lot of the questions coming in were actually uh, related to um, the issues that we had already anticipated um, covering in those webinars, and will also inform uh, the detailed planning for those webinars. So please do uh, stay tuned and join us again for the ongoing discussion. So um, the recording of today's events, both in video and audio podcast format, will be available on the event page in the coming days. That can be an ongoing resource for you. Feel free to share the link uh, with your colleagues, and if they'd like to contribute to the process or join the next, um, the next conversation, they're very welcome to do so. We'll also be posting the survey results once those have been fully analyzed, um, as mentioned. That will be in the, the coming weeks. Weeks. And if you didn't have the chance to complete the survey before the webinar, you do have one final chance today. We're going to open the survey back up. So if you'd like to contribute, you can do that. Um, if you do it before tomorrow, so by midnight today, is that right? Yes. By midnight today, we will be able to include your input in the final report. Uh, so then just to highlight the dates of those next events that I mentioned with the GPC, uh, the 19th of November, we're going to be looking at climate preparedness and community-based protection. We had a lot of questions I saw coming in uh, specifically related to climate, so those uh, will be informing the planning for that session. Then we'll have the third and final webinar in this collaboration with the GPC on the 26th of November. That's entitled Emerging Challenges for Humanitarian Protections. There are a number of, of issues that we plan to tackle there, and, and that will be informed as well by the results of today's events. I'd also like to briefly mention another upcoming event we have next month that's as part of PHEP series with ICFA, and we'll look at risk manage management for humanitarians. That will be on the 21st of November. Uh, so with that, I'd like to thank everyone, our panelists, participants, our partners at the GPC, my co-facilitator, Paul, for a very interesting discussion today, and we look forward to seeing you next time. That's in Herod Lang signing off from Geneva.